Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. Personal financial advisor, co-founder at Galileo Capital and regular money show contributor on personal finance, Warren Ingram, with us on a Thursday night, as usual. Uh, I was chatting to somebody the other day and they said to me, I don't want to invest anymore because it feels like I put money away for the future and I, I feel like I'm losing money all the time. I keep checking in on my investments. It keeps, um, you know, the markets have been so volatile, fluctuating all over the place. I'm getting really despondent about my investments. Investments. Is that common, Warren? It's absolutely common. I think it's uh, um, there are actually very few people that that kind of get a positive uh, sense from from their investments. Even when you when you track their investments over a number of years, you'll find that you know if you had, if you had to ask them intuitively, they would say it hasn't it hasn't grown much you know at, at all. Uh, and when you when you actually measure it, you, you might find a very different result where, where they've had a very good return. And and there's some kind of good ba- behavioral science behind this, and and then just some kind of just basic understanding of of how markets work. And so so the behavioral science part is we we get uh, let's say uh, kind of a kick of ten, you know, emotional kick of ten when when we make money, but but we get a, a kind of a, a emotional loss of about a hundred when we <laughs> lose money. So if you had to measure. Uh, money by unit, then you would say, well, you know, we we we're, we feel some sort of positive sense when when we make money, but but losing the same amount of money as as we've made, we we would actually feel a lot worse. So what, what what's so this called? Science, this is called this is called loss aversion, isn't it? I mean, we we over exaggerate the loss and we underemphasize the gains. Yeah, and it's actually just. Uh, it's kind of hardwired into our lizard brains. You know, we 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 kind of expect to make money. So when we do make the money, it's just what we expected. So you know, why why would we get excited? And and equally, we don't really expect to lose money. So when we do, uh, th- th- that sense of 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 loss kind of stays with us. It burns into our brain. And and then you know if you if you're doing that uh, over a period of time you look at it and you go yeah I, you know it's just this investing thing I don't really make much money out of it and you know when when people when you show people numbers and real numbers about how they actually have made money they're often really surprised you know they they just don't get it and and I think that's the the lizard brain part of us you know at play um, and and interesting I did I did see a study years ago with with psychologists. Who looked at um, you know really big multi billionaires who who lost a lot of money. You know? So someone who loses you know uh, uh, kind of a billion dollars and and ends up with only and I'm I'm saying it advisedly yes. but only a hundred million dollars, uh, and and the loss that they feel is almost on par with losing a very close loved one. They they actually they're sitting with a hundred million dollars <laughs> in the bank. You would think they would be very happy people, but but the the loss they've made is so big. And the emotional attachment so large that it's the same as if they'd lost, you know, someone that they actually love more than their money. Uh, so, 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 yeah, the, the psychology of this is is fascinating, but but we we also need to understand how the stock market works because it, it also explains some of this. Uh, and and if you had to look at the stock market, and you know the, the the markets all move in very similar fashions all around the world, but you look at a typical stock market over a typical hundred trading days. And over those 100 days, 55 of those days, the stock market will be up and 45 of those days, the stock market will be down. So bearing in mind the the lizard brain part, I've just told you the the little lecture I've just given you, uh, you're not going to feel that that psyched about your 100 days of 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 looking at your at your portfolio every single day because you're going to remember the losses much more than you're going to remember the gains. And, And so the the interesting thing about that is we obviously don't look at our portfolios daily when things are going well we don't look at the portfolios when you know things are trickling up and we feel things are you know markets and economy well, no and politics need are. because it's doing what it's oh. supposed to do so therefore you don't need to worry about it we only look at things when they you know when we when, when we're frightened when we when we're concerned and then of course we overemphasize the the negatives right Exactly, and then and then we you know we get a bit more frequent on our on our monitoring, and you know some people get get to sort of hourly monitor monitoring, which is really catastrophic, and 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 everyone else maybe you know ends up looking at it a couple of times uh, a week or or potentially every day, 
uh, and and just really a, a really bad idea. I, I mean, and I just think about myself when that when the Ukraine invasion happened. You know, I don't I don't track kind of world news unless I really absolutely have to, and I, I certainly don't look at it you know by the minute. But I can remember myself kind of being glued to two or three different global news channels just watching this crisis unfold. I mean, I have no ability to impact the crisis, but I'm watching it, you know, because it's a, a, a massive issue. And I think the same happens with, with people with stock markets. So so definitely, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing it. But when you look at, at the world stock markets again over time, and you say, well, hang on, you, you may only check into your investments once a year. The, the journey would be a lot different because actually what happens is, on a typical year, the stock market is up 75% of the time. So, so you would feel a lot different looking at your portfolio once a year than you would looking at it very frequently. Bearing in mind, we're only going to look at it when things are going down. That's when we look at it frequently. So it starts to become clear why we tend to think the markets don't reward us much, why, why we don't get excited and, and, and why we find it depressing. Uh, and, and I just, you know, when you jump out to kind of a, I mean, I'm not, no one's ever going to look at the investments only once every 10 years, but if you, if you had the fortitude to do that and Warren Buffett would be one of those people, you, you would find that 95% of the time you're making money. So kind of, uh, you know, l l listening to your, your, your intro about, you know, pe people who kind of get depressed about markets, I, I understand it. I understand the psychology and I understand because we start to watch the train wreck live as if we can do something about it by just watching. And unfortunately, what we should probably do is not watch anything and go fishing. Yeah, easier said than done. I mean, so yeah, the statistics then show if you look at your portfolio every day for 100 days, You'll be up 55 and down 45, but you'll have a disproportionate sense of loss because of the loss aversion theory. If you looked at it once a year, you'd be up 75% of the time. Once every three years, 84% of the time. And if you could manage to look only once a decade, you'd be up 95% of the time. The 5% wouldn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous, actually, uh, in terms of getting a little bit of perspective because it is easy to lose track or, 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 and lose perspective or, on investments. I got an email earlier from Robert Warren um, saying uh, Robert is grappling with whether to use a RAND denominated feeder offshore unit trust and ETF. So dollars or sterling uh, as a direct offshore investment. He may or may not leave South Africa. His concern is the weakening RAND over time as well as limited investment opportunities in South Africa. Robert says, would I be correct in saying that by keeping my RANDs in an offshore RAND-denominated feeder fund, I gain by RAND weakness and growth on underlying investments if the investment grows? Also, if the RAND weakens, I don't lose out on the underlying investment is in US dollars and the dollar strengthens. I then get this difference out in strengthening RANDs. Hmm? Question. Invest in, uh, and then it goes on a little bit in terms of some numbers and stuff. But just give us a, a sense of what Robert's conundrum is. So, so there, there are two sort of sets of dynamics when you're looking at investing overseas. The, the first one is, am I buying into a, uh, an overseas market that's that's offering good value? So, so how am I, how am I going to get the actual growth of the overseas market? So, so just to kind of simplify this a little bit. So, let's just say. You want to invest in the U.S. stock market, uh, and and then the question is, you know, if I've got dollars, uh, am I am I allocating those dollars correctly at the right time to to the to the value of the of the U.S. market, and do I make some money out of the the the, the stock market growing there? So so you know that that would be very similar to you know deciding to invest in the JSE with your rands, but but when you're making an investment decision to to allocate money overseas, you've got another complete different dynamic which you have to consider and that is the beloved exchange rate it's it's how much the rand is moving against the us dollar uh, and and you know when the rand let's say at the moment is sitting at whatever it is today 18 rand 10 cents to the dollar uh, someone like me is saying, gee, the, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's a, a great price to convert my rands into dollars I think the the rand is probably worth about 16 rand 50 to the dollar so so there is if you're going to send money out now, uh, just understand that you know that's that's kind of a whatever it is, 14, 15 percent 
uh, a loss that you're taking on the exchange rate because I, I believe the rand might come back uh, to, to that level of 1650. You're and, not and you're not a, to, you're not alone in that belief, Warren. Okay, I want to get to the belief in just a moment. But the thing that troubles me about Robert's question this evening is it is about the propensity of questions that come through at times like this where the rand has blown out. And and it, it has been a phenomenon I've noticed over 20 years of doing this show of people who, when things go bad, they go, oh, I need to move all my money into dollars, all my money into pounds. Um, and you know, over time, you get sort of forgiven by gradual val- devaluation of the rand. But often, we're making our offshoring decisions at precisely the wrong point because we're doing it based on fear, not because, hey, it's a good idea to do so. Exactly right, and you know, the, to, to me, this this um, this kind of movie we're living in right now feels a lot like the movie we all lived through from the year nineteen ninety nine through to the year two thousand, and then all the way up until twenty ten. Uh, but you know, at, at that time, we had this uh, horrible emerging markets crisis, you know, and it was the end of the Asian tigers, and all emerging markets were, according to kind of Time Magazine and everybody else, you know, it was the end of emerging markets and and the end of South Africa. And people sent their money out at you know at any exchange rate they could, uh, and and what what subsequently happened was we had the 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 tech bubble burst in America, the stock market in America did nothing for a decade, and the South African market boomed, uh, and and if you look at valuations, and I'm certainly not saying that's exactly the story that's going to unfold in in the current kind of movie that we're in now, but but this looks like a similar kind of movie. Uh, and and to me, you're looking at two things: the the valuation of the of the stock exchange in South Africa, so the average price of the companies that you're buying on, on the JSE, versus the average price of the companies that you're buying in America, just to stay on the American theme. And South African companies are much cheaper than than American companies. So so what what you're doing now is you're you know if you're sending money overseas, you're buying into a market that was cheap a little while ago. It's not so cheap anymore overseas. And you're you're sending your rands out at a horrific exchange rate, and and the, the there's, there's another kind of behavioral thing around this which is called recency bias. You know whatever's happened in the last year or two in our brains, that's what's burnt into our brains, and we believe that's what's going to happen for the next thousand years. And and the last year or two definitely not been great for emerging markets, definitely not been great for South Africa, and so the rand is weaker. And and now we project mentally project that that's what's going to happen forever. And of course, that's not what's going to happen forever. Markets move in cycles, and 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 this cycle will turn again. And, and I know um, we, we've got you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of listeners throwing um, something at their radio right now, going, "Are you nuts? Have you do you not know we've got stage six load shedding and all the other problems we've got?" I, I'm I'm fully aware, uh, and and my commentary around this is. Uh, we're in a big cycle where emerging markets as a, as a class, as a class of assets are out of favor. And when they come back into favor again, and they will, then we will benefit from that. How much we benefit and how, how well we perform relative to other emerging markets is anybody's guess. But we will participate in that in that turning of the cycle and that's the the logic i don't i'm not factoring in that uh you know i think it's going to be fixed next week and we're going to have no load shedding ever again of course we're going to have power problems probably until june june or august next year but the cycle turns and bearing in mind our stock market is not just the price of south africa's economy we've got very big businesses operating all around the world that are really cheap and selling all of your rands buying dollars Really bad idea. But let's say Robert decides he wants to do this anyway because he wants the peace of mind. He's willing. He's like he's willing to, in the short term, he believes to 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 take the chance of losing out and seeing the 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 dollar uh, lose value and the rand retrace a little bit. But he's got a long term view. He wants to put his money into dollars and he wants to put it into funds. Does he keep it in rand denominated funds? Does he convert it into dollars? What does he do as of now as a sensible strategy? We discussed lots of theory. If he bu- what should he do? If he buys my argument somewhat, in other words, he says, okay, I don't want to just send it all out at one shot. Th- then what he could do is he could do it via a debit order or, or let's say monthly lump sums. And if he's going to do that, so he's going to break up that capital into smaller bunches and, and do them, let's just say, I mean, to me, a debit order makes all the sense in the world. Then I think a feeder fund is the right idea because you're not being exposed to the 
foreign exchange costs of the banks, converting your rands into dollars. What, uh, so a fee, a, one, sorry, a, a feeder fund is a locally denominated fund, right? So it's invested in offshore investments, but it's uh, it, it's you pay for it in rands and it stays in rands. It stays in rands. However, if the rand goes from 18 rand 10 at the moment to you know, 25 rand, you will make profit on that that seven rand difference in, in exchange rate plus whatever the, the international markets have done in terms of their growth. Right. So you're not losing out on the exchange rate falling apart if you do that. So so not a bad idea. But if you're going to do a big lump sum and, 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 and you know, send a large amount of money overseas, then then by all means convert your rands to dollars, send it out uh, and then buy the, the, the markets on the other side. All right. Thank you. I think, Robert, hopefully, Robert, you're happy with that answer. Um, and then a question uh, this evening uh, from, and the person's name has been cut off this page, which upsets me enormously, from Angie. It's from Angie. My fiancé and I will be getting married at the end of this year. Congratulations, Angie. Uh, we haven't really discussed money and finances. Oh, dear, Angie. When is the right time to discuss money and our plans? I want to ensure that we're on the same page regarding our finances to avoid any surprises. I fear, Warren, that Angie may have left this conversation just a little bit late. Uh, I, 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 um, I was going to be flippant and say, um, Angie, the right time to ask that question was before you said yes. On the uh, first if, if, date, yes. <laughs> you know, assuming your fiance uh, proposed, then before before you said yes, I would have said, "Can we have a conversation about money? Uh, not not how much are you going to pay me, but how how does your finances work? How do my finances work? Uh, and and what do we think about certain things like debt, etc.? So it's not too late. You're not married yet, uh, and and I'm not now. I'm not being flippant. I think uh, I think certainly before you kind of commit commit to each other legally uh, and and tie your financial futures together in a very legal way, uh, you need to have a very hard uh, co- conversation about uh, about money where you're both honest because uh, uh, money troubles especially when one person for example is really diligent and sensible with money and the other one isn't or one's got a debt problem and the other one doesn't uh, m- money troubles like that um, are, are one of the really biggest uh, i think it's top two biggest causes of divorce uh, so so this is a serious thing angie when, when you're you know when you when you're getting married to to someone that you hope to stay married to for the rest of your life then, then you have the conversation now uh, and and you're talking about uh, you know what's our approach to debt what th- these are my assets these are my debts this is my income please show me yours uh, and and it's important because you, you when you get married uh, you you are taking on you know some portion of responsibilities for for the other person's financial position as well uh, and and certainly knowing before the time that the person you're getting married to is very good with money or very bad with money uh, allows you to to protect yourself uh, legally and and one of the things then will be make sure that you're you're sitting down with a lawyer to say you know I, i'm 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 really good with money my partner's not and and we're getting married how do I protect myself uh, against them, you know, f- financially misbehaving, for example? And, it and is, you know, th- there are ways that you do that. It feels like the least romantic conversation to be had at a time where you're supposed to be coddled in candy floss and feeling heart flutters and joy. But it is the kindest thing you can do to this person with whom you want to spend possibly the rest of your lives, hopefully the rest of your lives. And it's the kindest conversation you can have, as difficult and as uncomfortable as it might seem to be. Um, And you kind of would hope that by the time you get to the proposal stage, you have a decent sense of their values and what they value and the way they behave. Because a conversation about money, I'm not sure is enough, Warren, in terms of like, how do you feel about money? Well, I love money. We, me too. Um, I, I love treats. Me too. I, I, I'd love to invest one day. Oh, me too. That's not an agreement about money. That's not, um, we, we, we share, a, you know, a fairly common set of principles there. But it doesn't tell us about our habits. It doesn't tell us about our predilections. It doesn't tell us where we come from. It So much of what informs our thinking around money is stuff that, you know, the way we were brought up, where we grew up, how we grew up, financial stress in our families when we were little, whatever it might be. Um, those things you've got to understand blim and well long before proposal stage comes along is, is my view on that one, Warren. Agreed, and 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 I think you know maybe also just to understand that the you know if one of the two people in the relationship 
isn't good with money uh, and and potentially sitting with you know a, a credit card bill that they're not really able to deal with properly or you know too, too much other debt um, it's important to understand that uh, they might have a really deep sense of shame around this you know i think we we can't we can't underestimate the psychological impact of this so it's not just you know th- th- that people are sitting there you know just recklessly spending and and you know being uh, completely undisciplined and 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 kind of reckless with with their partner's money they, they might have had to deal with some big debt issue for you know family reason or whatever it is but now they sit with this and it's something they haven't brought up simply because they've got a deep sense of shame. And it's an incredibly tough conversation for that person to kind of just volunteer the information. So, you know, if you're if you're in Angie's position, it's it's understanding that when you have this, you know, let's let's now put our bank statements on the table conversation. And that's really what you do have to do. Uh, just be really kind of sensitive to the fact that the person on the other side of the table might be really keen to solve a problem and and really ashamed of where they are and and not looking for you know some sort of big judgment you know where you go oh my goodness what on earth have you done you know what, what's wrong with you? you you kind of need to sit down and say let's talk it through how did we get here how did you get here and and what are what is our strategy because it is now an hour what is our strategy going to be to solve this problem and, and I think you can you know you can build a really strong relationship on a difficult conversation and you can break a really strong relationship w- without having the difficult conversation so so it's definitely worth doing now but do it with a lot of sensitivity and and a lot of understanding that it's it's really kind of this is embarrassing you know this is tough stuff to talk about and a lot of families never talk about money so it will be very hard for a lot of people to have this conversation so, so do it gently but but don't avoid it you have to do this you, you have to kind of share everything you're going to share your lives you need to understand the the money position you don't have to share the money you don't have to share your savings forever and all of that stuff but you you have to be clear now about your your financial positions and how you're going into this you do need to know what you're getting yourself into um you know (laughs) that it, it can go horribly awry angie horribly horribly awry when you make an unpleasant discovery six months in a year in five years in or worse, when there are kids in in the picture as well, and suddenly you realised, oh my goodness gracious me, I actually don't know this person that I've been married to for all this time at all. Terrifying, but necessary. Warren Ingram, founder and director at Galileo Capital, personal financial advisor, and Thursday night contributor, of course, to The Money Show.